Well, good morning, and welcome to Clearwater Bay Church in Hong Kong and our online worship gathering for January the 31st, 2021. We hope that you've been uh, following along with us as we've been in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, and we hope that it's been encouraging to you and to your faith as you journey with the Lord uh, through this wilderness, through this life, uh, headed toward uh, your eternal destination. Uh, if you know Jesus Christ, the Bible says that your eternal destination is with Him in the promised land of God, the, uh, the what we call heaven. So we pray that today as you listen, if you don't know Jesus, that you will come to know Him today, that you will trust in Him as we will read, that you will look to Him and believe uh, today. If you already know Christ, uh, it's our hope and prayer that today you'll be encouraged to continue on in the faith, to walk in holiness with the Lord, uh, to strive to obey Him in every single area of your life so that you can experience the joy in the journey, even though it may be in the wilderness. So have your Bibles open today to Numbers chapter 20 and 21, and we pray that you will be encouraged. We hope that during this time, this pandemic, as it's still going on, uh, it's our hope that you will get together in a home group or a small group or a, a small life transformation group with two or three others and continue to um, belong to the body of Christ, even as you personally uh, and with others behold God and see Him and read His Word daily, as well as being sent to those around you, both your neighbors and the nations. Let's continue to pray that God will stop this pandemic, that we might be able to continue to fulfill the Great Commission Let's pray together as we begin this morning. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we just want to pause and we want to declare that you are the Lord. You are God. There is no other. And we look to you. We look to you for deliverance from a pandemic, and we look to you for deliverance from the disease that every single one of us has, sin. We thank you that you have provided a cure, a remedy that's 100% effective for sin, and that is Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for our sins. Thank you for raising him from the dead that we might have life after sin and we might have eternal life with you. So God, as we worship you today, as we pray, as we look in your word, would you be honored and glorified? And we ask these things we come to you in the name of Jesus, the only mediator between us and you. Amen.
Well, have your Bibles open to Numbers chapter 20 and 21 today. We want to recap a little bit as we have been in the book of Numbers for a few weeks. Uh, week number one, we saw the children of Israel uh, on Mount Sinai or at Mount Sinai. And they had been there for a year preparing to leave. Uh, so the end of their time, they're making preparations. They're arranging the camp. They're situating uh, who's going to march out first, who's going to go where. The Ark of the Covenant's going before them. And they took the Passover. So we saw the preparations in week one. In week two, we saw them leave Mount Sinai. They left and they headed out toward the wilderness of Paran. And three days into it, the complaining started with everyone. Week number three, uh, God told Moses to send out the 12 spies or the 12 scouts to see what the land was like. And you remember, 10 of them came back and said, there's no way we cannot do this. And two of them said, we can do it easily. Remember Joshua and Caleb. Ten of them had fear, and two of them had faith. And they led all of the people to rebel, and they all said they wanted to go back to Egypt, choose a new leader, uh, and God judged them. You remember God judged them, and a lot of people lost their lives. And one of the things God said is He said, um, this old generation that came out of Exodus, came out of Egypt, uh, your bodies will die in the wilderness, die in the sand, and you will not make it to the promised land. I will raise up the next generation and I'll send them in. And this all took place in year number two. Well, now today, as we come to chapter 20 in the book of Numbers, it's year 40. 38 years have gone by. 38 years of virtual silence. Now in Numbers chapter 33, we have a, a recounting or a summary of all of the places where they camped uh, while they were in the wilderness. And we don't have any of the details. We just have the place names but if we look in Numbers 33, we see that it's, it's clear that it was 38 years later that they came back to Kadesh Barnea, and they're on their way now. We pick up the story. They're back in Kadesh Barnea on the southern part of the land, uh, the promised land, and they're going to go up and around to the east uh, to try to get into the land. But the old generation, some of them are still alive, but their time is coming to an end. We might want to call this the beginning of the end of the Exodus generation. They've almost all died. Not all of them, but most of them. And what we're going to see in chapters 20 and 21 is we're going to see some tastes of victory as they interact with the nations around them. Not the nations inside the promised land, but those that are on the borders and around them. And so they've got to pass through some people's territory in order to get to the promised land. So today what I want to do is I want to break these, these two chapters up into the following parts, um, the trials and the triumphs, or the triumphs first and then the trials of year number 40. So there's some triumphs that happen, some good things, and yet there's some still, still some trials that take place that we will see, and we'll see the Exodus generation dying off. So first, let's look at the triumphs, the triumphs, some tastes of victory. We have one fight avoided and three fights won. 
one fight avoided and three fights won as they are moving around through these different people's territory up into and or up and around the promised land but not into it yet so we see them uh, want to pass through the territory of Edom in Numbers chapter 20, 14 through 21. So chapter 20, 14 through 21, uh, we have this kingdom of Edom, which is the kingdom of Esau. So you remember Jacob's brother Esau. Uh, these are his descendants. Let's read that. Numbers 20, verse 14. This is a, the first fight avoided. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, You know all the hardship that we have met, how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we lived in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers. And when we cried to the Lord, we heard, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, the city on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right or to the left until we have passed through your territory. Verse 18, But Edom said to him, You shall not pass through, lest I come out with the sword against you. And they did come out against them with the sword. Now, God had already told, if we look at Deuteronomy chapter 2, which Deuteronomy chapters 1, 2, and 3 is very important for the book of Numbers, gives a little summary in three chapters. But God had already told Moses, you cannot take the land of Esau, the land of Edom, because I've given it to them. So don't even try. So they just say, let us pass through your land and Edom Esau says no. They wouldn't let them pass through, and they came out with a great army. So this fight was avoided. They turned away from them because God said, you can't have this land. So they weren't going to fight and take it. And so they obeyed the Lord. They asked for passage. They said no. And so they start to go around. Well, as they start to go around, they've avoided this one fight, but they encounter three others in which they need to defend themselves and they need to take the land. So in Numbers chapter 21, in Numbers chapter 21, 1 through 3, we have this Canaanite, the king of Arad, come out against them. It's just a brief story in Numbers 21, 1 through 3, where the people, some of the people are taken captive as these people kind of raid on them. But Israel goes to God, the people go to God, and they say, God, what do you want us to do? If you'll give us this land and we will we'll defeat these people, then we will devote everything to destruction. And God said, go and do it. So that's the king of Arad. And then secondly, in Numbers 21, 21 to 30, we have the king of Heshbon, King Sihon. They sent messengers to King Sihon of the Amorites, and they asked him also, Let us pass through your territory. But like Esau, he came out and he fought against Israel, and Israel defeated them and took their cities. This is in year 40, before going up into the Promised Land, along the borders of Israel. And then thirdly, we have another fight with the king of Bashan, King Og. Verses 21, chapter 21, 31 to 35. And in the same way, he came out against them, but the Lord gave him and his people into the hand of Israel, and there were no survivors. So here we have one fight avoided with Esau's descendants, and then three fights won. And these tastes of victory... Uh, are an encouragement to the new generation. It's been a long time, and now they're starting, as they go around in toward the promised land, they are able to defeat some of these nations and have some tastes of victory. 
And according to Deuteronomy chapter 2, 14 through 16, at these battles, the old soldiers from the Exodus generation are all dying away. God is fulfilling His promise, which He said that the old generation would die away. And he's also fulfilling His promise. He's being faithful to bring the people into the promised land. It's this new generation that's going to go in, and the old generation is dying off. So in 20 and 21, what we really have is this transitional period of the old the folks from the old generation are dying away in the wilderness, and yet as they're going up and around, the new generation is seeing some victories. So it's triumphs, and yet we'll also have some trials. They're not there yet. There's still some of the old generation around, such as Moses, such as Aaron, and Miriam, his sister, and some others. So we've looked at the, tri the triumphs really quickly. I want to look at the trials now. So, number one, I want us to see the siblings' fate. The siblings' fate. Whose siblings? Well, the family of Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Of course, Miriam's the oldest, and then Aaron, and then Moses is the baby. Well, in Numbers chapter 20, verse 1, we have this introduction. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, year 40 in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, or Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now, we don't have any details about Miriam's death. We don't have an explanation. It's just that Miriam, the older sister of Moses, you remember Miriam, uh, the little girl who pushes the basket out into the reeds in Egypt and follows it along and, and then goes to Pharaoh's daughter and says, hey, I've got, a, I've got a perfect person who can be a nursemaid and goes and gets Moses' mother. This girl, this little girl who's been all along, who struggled with wanting to take leadership away from Moses and uh, the Lord struck her with leprosy, and then it seems she was healed after seven days. This is the older sister. It must have been a sad day to see this older sister pass away. But what about Moses and Aaron? Up until this point, we've heard nothing really of whether or not they specifically were told that they also would not be going in. Maybe they assumed everybody else would not be going in. But what about them? Numbers chapter 20, we have the story which seals their fate. Numbers 20, chapter 2. Let's read. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? Sound familiar? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. And there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. Tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. Verse 9. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock 
And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank in their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. Now, 40 years before coming out of Egypt, Moses uh, had been told again to bring water out of the rock for the people. A different time, a different place, he was told to strike the rock, and God provided water. The same answer, but different means. He was to speak, he was to, speak to it this time. A display of God's power without any action. Just the spoken word, and God would bring out water. But Moses was angry, and he hit it with his staff twice and said, Shall we bring water for you? Meaning, he and Aaron... Moses robbed God of his glory. God was going to get glory by Moses just speaking to the rock and the water coming out. And then they would marvel at God, not Moses. Moses robbed God of the glory. The judgment, God said, Moses and Aaron will not go into the promised land. In chapter 20... Verses 22 to 29, we see that very quickly Aaron died. Aaron died. <clears throat> Chapter 20, verse 22 says this, And they journeyed from Kadesh, and the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came to Mount Hor. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron at Mount Hor on the border of the land of Edom, Let Aaron be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land that I have given to the people of Israel, because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eliezer, his son, and bring them up to Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments and put them on Eliezer, his son. And Aaron shall be gathered to his people and shall die there. Moses did as the Lord commanded. Stop for a minute. Can you imagine how hard that would be? Moses did what the Lord commanded, but that command was to strip his brother of the priestly garments and watch him die. And they went up to Mount Hor, verse 27, in the sight of all the congregation. Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eliezer, his son. And Aaron died there on top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eliezer came down from the mountain. And when the congregation saw that Aaron had perished and all the house of Israel wept for Aaron 30 days, so the siblings' fate is sealed. The siblings, Miriam, dies in the first month, January, let's say. Aaron dies in month number five. We know that from Deuteronomy, or from Numbers 33. Moses, it seems, died in the 11th month. So in the same year in year 40, Miriam in month one, Aaron in month five, Moses in month 11, right before the entry to the promised land. So Aaron is gone. Miriam is gone. Only Moses is left with some of the last remaining grumblers. And even Moses won't enter. So here we see, first we look at the, we've looked at the siblings' fate. The siblings, this one family, these leaders of the congregation... We see that their fate is sealed. And now, instead of looking at the siblings' fate, let's look at the poisonous snakes. It seems that when we compare Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, 
that this event, this bronze serpent, this poisonous snakes, is the last grumbling event when the last of Israel's old generation dies. Poisonous snakes. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. So they said there's no food or water. There is food, but they loathe that food. Manna. Verse 6. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, we've seen this old generation and new generation experience some triumphs. And yet, as the old generation is dying off, we also see some trials. First, the siblings' fate, Moses and Aaron and Miriam's fate is sealed here in the desert. And now we see these poisonous snakes, these, these vipers or these angry serpents... Uh, attacking people. This final trial here, it seems, for the old generation. This fiery serpents, what are they? These bronze serpents. It could be a play on words. It could be that they were bronze colored or copper colored and they were biting people. And then Moses puts a bronze colored snake up on a pole. Or it could be fiery, could be describing their temperament, the temperament of the snakes. Well, it's a strange story, but we see the people, at least some of them, we don't know who, how many, turned to the Lord. And they said, we have sinned against the Lord and against you, Moses. And Moses prayed for them and interceded for them. And the people were healed. They just were bitten and they looked on the snake on a pole and they were healed. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but on an ambulance and in hospitals, there's always this picture of a pole with a snake wrapped around it. Sometimes two snakes, which is a, actually incorrect, but one snake um, wrapped around it. Now, many people say it comes from Greek mythology, and that may be true, but there's definitely evidence that this snake on a pole for healing at a hospital, considering most hospitals were started by Christians, not from ancient Greeks, that they use that symbol still today. When you go to a hospital, you see a snake on a pole, and you look at it, and it provides healing for you, a place of healing. But here, if they just look on the snake, they are healed. Now, Jesus quoted this passage himself. In John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So what does he mean? What does Jesus mean? Well, what was causing death in the people? What was causing death was the fangs of a snake piercing people's skin and infecting them with poison. And the remedy was not the snake was the problem. And the remedy was to put a snake on a pole that would bring healing. In a similar way, the picture is that man is infected with a poison called sin. 
sin in man brings death to him, but sin being put on to a man, Jesus, brings life and healing. A person who is bitten gets healed when they look at the pole, the snake. A person gets forgiveness and healing from sin when they look to Jesus. Interestingly, it says a person who is bitten. You know, a person needs to see first that they're actually bitten by sin. And you know, many people today don't see it. They don't think that they are sinners or that they need a cure. People refuse to look to Jesus. But if you want to live... You must look to Jesus. If you wanted to live in numbers after being bit by a snake, you just needed to look to the snake and you would be saved. And those who look to Jesus, the crucified Christ on the pole at Calvary, hanging there, believe and you will live. We see several triumphs in the book of Numbers. We see them... Uh, defeating some nations that are around them and avoiding a fight with their their old ancestors, um, brother Esau. And yet we see here in chapter 20 and 21, these last final trials of the old generation. Now there's a big one coming next week. But these trials that are coming for this old generation, and it seems here at the end, we have in this trial both God's judgment for the last of the complainers, as well as God's mercy. Now, there are all kinds of applications, as we've mentioned each week, that we can get from these chapters when we're looking at a big section, like two chapters, 20 and 21. Some of the things I thought about were these. Do what God says to do this time exactly as you ought, and don't presume to do it in the way that you did it last time, but obey God just as He says now. Secondly, I see God is faithful and will accomplish His purposes with us or in spite of us, but we miss great blessings when we don't obey Him. God is being faithful to His promises to bring the people into the land And sadly, the old generation could have experienced that, but because of disobedience, they did not. Nevertheless, God is faithful. Another one would be, someone might be passing through your territory on their way to what God wants for them. And you might ought to consider letting them pass through, maybe even pass through your life and through your home and and into your a relationship with you on their way to what God is has for them. Perhaps God might want to use you to be a blessing to them and to share with them the good news about Jesus as they pass through you, the territory of your life. And yet sometimes when people want to pass through our territory, our lives, we want to fight against them or... We want to tell them to go around the other way. You may be fighting against God's plan for this person's life because of your own insecurities or fears like Esau. Also, sin won't make you forfeit heaven if you know Jesus Christ, but it sure will make you forfeit joy in the journey. Sin won't make you forfeit heaven if you know Jesus, but it sure will make you forfeit joy in the journey. But of course, the greatest application that we get from the book of Numbers in this chapter is that sin is still lodged in man's DNA. It shows itself continually in everyone, from grumbling to disbelief to immorality, jealousy, anger. And there's only one remedy. And that remedy comes through the mercy of God. 
And the remedy is the crucified Christ. The crucified Christ on a pole. Jesus hung on the cross and gave His life that whoever looks to Him might be saved. You may ask yourself, excuse me, you may ask yourself in the situation of Moses, I don't really think God is fair. I mean, Moses... Moses only did one little thing wrong and he got punished for that? You mean, I don't do a whole lot wrong. I'm just as good as everybody else. Why should I be punished forever in hell because of just, you know, being not a perfect person, not a pretty good person? Well, James chapter 2 verse 10 tells us this. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. You see, God is holy. He is perfect. He cannot tolerate imperfection in His presence because of His goodness and perfection, glory, justice, wisdom, truth. Just one sin is enough to separate you from Him forever. But praise be to God, just one bite, though one, just one bite will get you. Jesus is is the one who can heal you. You know, it's much like today, everybody's talking about um, vaccines. Listen, folks, we've got a vaccine. We've got a vaccine against sin. We have a cure. There's only one cure. It's Jesus. And it works for everybody who believes in Him. For those of us who believe in Christ, He's taken away our sin. He was punished for us, and we will make it to the promised land. Oh yes, Christian, you will make it to the promised land. You know what? Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. He got to see it. But we do know that later um, he appeared with Elijah there before Christ in the promised land. So Moses wasn't banished forever, but he didn't get to go in right then. What did Moses lose? Moses lost the joy of being able to go in with the people. Moses lost the joy of the experience of going into the promised land. That's what happens to us when we sin. Our sin doesn't separate us from God forever if we've trusted in Christ because Christ was punished for our sin and And now there's no more condemnation, Romans 8, 1, for those who are in Christ Jesus. But sin robs us of our joy. Sin robs us of our joy in the journey and the blessings that we experience with others for what God has for us. So Christian... I encourage you to press on in holiness. You may be experiencing today and say, you know what, I don't really have any joy. I I mean, I'm a Christian. I know I'm going to heaven. Pretty sure that I am. But, you know, I don't have much joy. Well, ask yourself if there is any sin in your life that's separating you from God and from others. And turn away from your sin and come back to the loving arms of your Savior who died for you and receive His mercy. Let's pray together. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll take this exposition of this, these texts and I pray that you will um, make it encouraging to somebody out there, make it encouraging to our whole church and whoever might be watching online that they might be encouraged in their faith, Lord. And I pray that if there's anybody out there today who, who, is, who doesn't know Jesus, that today would be the day that they would look to Him and be cured. We pray in His name. Amen. What love could we
You. Yeah.